This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week's sponsor is StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps your loved ones share stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. It's the gift of spending time together wherever you live. Get started right away without the need for shipping by going to storyworth.com slash walk-ins. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash walk-ins for $10 off. This week, we're deviating from the normal walk-ins welcome format because a lot of people have been asking me who I am and what I do and how I got here and what is fetacy and a lot of questions. So I thought I'd start this new segment that we'll do occasionally called Story Hour with Bridget Fetacy. Some names have been bleeped to protect the innocent. All right. So it's time for another Story Hour. We have not had one of these in quite some time. And this is the perfect time to be doing one, especially since we're all trapped inside. We're going to talk about Bridget's travels, which she's had a lot of travels. We're certainly not going to be able to cover it all in one go, I think. Cause Didn't we talk about this already? There are stories. <laughs> no, we have not covered your travels. Wow. We might have brushed over them or mentioned them here and there, but um, we have, I want to start from the beginning and, and just I want to hear some of the stories and we'll see how Which far ones? we get. Exactly. Well, this, this takes the... We're, we're going to start with... Mexico? Well, we're going to start with, do you remember the first time you ever traveled out of the country? Mexico. How old were you? Um, I was like 14. Oh, is this when you got really <laughs> bad sunburn? Someone actually <laughs> sent me a pic. Oh, my sister posted a picture on freaking Facebook recently. And I was like, oh, my God, it's... <laughs> It's it's the Mexico trip where I had desitin <laughs> all over my face or like noxema or something. No, it was, it was desitin because I think one of the kids was still. I mean, I was the youngest was probably five. For some reason, my mom had desitin with us. Okay, so tell all right. So you went on a family trip out of the country. You ha- you it you were there my, are five kids in your family. It was with my mom. It was my first trip w- with my mom and my stepdad. Ooh, yeah. Okay. And the only one. We never took another one again. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Telling. Um, And so you guys, where do you remember where you went in Mexico? We went to, it was right outside, I think, oh gosh, it was on the East Coast and it was outside of Cancun. I think it was like Tulum, but it it was outside of... It was like a little, we rented like a house in a little... Okay, so it wasn't like a resort or anything like that? No, 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 no. Okay. No. My, that's like one one area where my I think I got that from my mom. Mm-hmm. I just never mm-hmm. wanted any part of the resort. Package, Even later, whatever. when I was yeah, dating yeah, yeah. the rich dude, I was I just made him promise that we wouldn't do just Ritz Carlton's, uh-huh. which sounds like the snobbiest thing to say ever. But it's I'm sure it's, it's so sterilized. Yeah, and when you are poor and travel. And I was poor traveling, going from hostels, taking all kinds of public transportation. And then I met this rich guy. And it's like you never I I always said you go from like the backpack to the suitcase. Right. You don't experience the country the same way. You you don't don't interact with the the plebs or the people. Yeah. Only in so much as that they're doing things for you. Right. Which is, yeah, nuts. All right. Well, we'll get to that. So Mexico. Do you remember how long it was? Like a week, 10 days, two weeks? I think it was like a week. Okay. Yeah. And it was like spring break. <laughs> so tell And me- I was at that really awkward phase. You had the braces? Is this your yeah, braces? Yeah, you can tell stage? I was just getting my boobs. Uh huh. You know, they were just, it looked like the boobs just got, came. Uh huh. Like they just arrived. <laughs> and I had braces and I had gotten a perm. Oh, wow. Because. You know, why was, not? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> no, I just wanted a perm. It was kind of my, yeah, it was a very, it was the awkward, phase. very awkward phase. Uh-huh. 
Actually, it's funny because it was when I was obsessed with Georgetown University, oh. which is what I was writing about yesterday. And um, I always wore this like Georgetown hat that was way too big for my head with hoop earrings. <laughs> it was a disaster. We'll see if we can find some pictures and post them <laughs> on Fantasy. <laughs> I'm sure they exist. Um, okay. Uh, well, so tell the people what happened. Was it your first day? It was the first day we were there and we all ran and went in the water and my siblings and I, my mom was like, put sunscreen on and we were old enough to handle that ourselves. But we were like, oh, we're just going to jump in because it was so hot. But we ended up staying in the water for like hours, uh -huh. two or three hours, just playing and playing and playing. And I think my mom just forgot we had, didn't have sunscreen on and we were in Minnesota. So we were butt ass white. Uh huh. And my sister and I later were so sick, we got sun poisoning. Uh -huh. And I got it the worst. And my face got um, all of, like started blistering up pretty much immediately. Which see, isn't that like second degree burns? Yeah, when you it blister? was bad. Yeah. It was the one and all over my face. Oh. And my mom was like, holy shit. Like, m you know how my mom is oh, about skin. Yeah. She was like, oh my God. Um, so she made me wear desitin, which is basically just pure zinc. Uh -huh. uh, brilliant move, really, looking back on my face like the whole time. I yeah. couldn't go in the sun. I couldn't. I was so sick. I was throwing up. Uh huh. And but you had a like fever. Scarred. Your face could have. Yeah, scarred. my mom like was like, she made me put a hat on and she made me wear desitin and stay out of sun the sun the whole time. And I was so mad. And now, thank God she did that. But I was just mad because we still went about our vacation and went to all these right. places. And I just have freaking desitin all over my face <laughs> looking miserable like this. This is embarrassing enough to be a teenager who just got her boobs. Your poor bedraggled perm. <laughs> yeah, my perm fell out. So my hair doesn't really hold <laughs> curls, but the only the front of my perm <laughs> fell out. So like, well, if you were wearing a hat, yeah. <laughs> no, my perm fell out immediately after I got my perm. Oh no! <laughs> and so they redid it, but it still just will not. It wouldn't stay in my front, the front parts of my <laughs> perm. So it was like <laughs> just a curly back part and straight front part. <laughs> it was a disaster. There are pictures somewhere. We will find them. We will find them. <laughs> I hope they all got lost in that tragic <laughs> incident when I tried to send my pictures and moved in the country. box like exploded. <laughs> yeah. Whenever people talk about saving the United States Postal Service, I think about that and I'm like, fuck them. Fuck them. We're just memory box like disintegrated <laughs> a halfway across the country. God knows what's strewn about all over and the place. And they still sent me the box with other people's <laughs> shit in it and some of mine. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, granted, it was 50 pounds. I probably could have put it in two boxes, but oh, what, what the hell were they thinking? Just filling it with other people's random memorabilia and keys? <laughs> Obviously, a bunch of stuff was all mixed in together. Okay, so that was your first experience traveling outside the country. Not the greatest experience. No, I also got sick from the water or something. Oh, no. Yep, so I had a fever, and my face was blistering, and I had diarrhea. <laughs> it was a great wow. time. So then, then... Uh, I don't think I went anywhere. We went to Canada when we drove through Canada with my stepdad when they were going to move back east, and that was when I was like in the trunk of the car. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking about this recently, too. <laughs> Like, what kind of car was You're it? You're in, like, like a the... blizzard and a fucking Mazda. Like, a tiny little white Mazda. <laughs> Were you in, like, the back back? Like, actually in the no, trunk? No, I or was in, in the like... trunk because there was no room in this car. So, I opened, like, the back door that led to the trunk. And we would take... We would, like, trade off turns in the trunk. Oh, my God. And I was like, what are... We? My my stepdad, if he hadn't pulled over anything... He hadn't gotten arrested. Yeah, he's with three children who aren't his own. One of them is in the trunk. Crossing into a different country yeah. with a child in the trunk of his car. <laughs> wow. Okay. But we didn't... I don't remember very much about Canada. Other than just being, <laughs> being in the trunk of a car. Yeah, I'm sure you were just back there reading. There's music. There was a lot there was a lot of music too. It was the, it was like that time. If I hear the music now, I think, oh, this reminds me of being in that trunk. 
<laughs> like what a fucking maniac. Oh God. Yeah, so we would one person would be in the front and then one person would be in the back and then we'd open the little like, like yeah, door that pass li- through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then somebody would get in the trunk. But then would you pop the seat up and someone would sit back in it or not? Or were you just sometimes. trying to create space? No, sometimes and you'd actually you'd be, like, be like locked like in the trunk. In, and sometimes <laughs> you'd just be in the trunk. <laughs> wow. Sleeping. <laughs> <sighs> you have some weird stories. <laughs> That's one I've never heard before. And, and I've heard a lot of your stories. My stepdad was like 32 at the time. Oh, my God. Because he was new to the family. He must have been 32 or 33. He was young. Wow. Because he was eight years younger than my mom. So here's this 33-year-old guy crossing into Canada with three children under the age of like 14. Oh, my God. <laughs> that aren't his own. Wow. I know. I think he had some kind of documentation, but I'm not sure. And this is pre-cell phones, by the way. Right. It's a good thing you didn't just vanish into the (laughs) hinterlands of Canada. (laughs) No. (laughs) So I don't even know why we took that way. It was because we were in Minnesota. And then for some reason, we decided to go up through Canada and down into Maine. Huh. Because we were looking. That was like one of their, you know, every day we'd come home and it was like, we're moving to Alaska. We're moving to Hawaii. And that was. Right. We're we're moving moving to to Maine. Maine. So we went and looked. That's crazy. Okay, so then when did you, what was your next trip out of the country? Mexico again, right? Mexico again. For, is this for the yoga thing or? No. Okay. That was for spring break my senior year. Oh, we're into spring break. Senior year of high school, yeah. obviously, yes. With oh. with my with my best friend and travel buddy. Yeah. She had never been out of the country and never seen the ocean. Wow. Because she was born and raised in Minnesota. And wow. now she, this girl has, she's a flight attendant. Right. She has seen every, I mean, her, she has one of those passports that is just, it's, she had to get like the Extensions. extension. Yeah. yeah. She's, no, she travels an insane amount, not even for work. She'll take advantage of like the perks of work to just oh, travel yeah. all it's over the so world. It's so cheap. Yeah. It's crazily cheap. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is the only reason that job is worth it because God knows there's no other reason that that job is worthwhile. <laughs> no offense to flight attendants out there. No, no offense, but it is it is a gru- grueling. That, I mean, you want to talk about waitressing being hard. This is waitress yeah. in the sky it's so hard right and you're first responder and you get treated like shit right and your but your time clock is all oh crazy mess. there's you have no sense of time or what day it she is. would leave at like three in the morning for shifts and some people they commute so she commutes from minnesota to la right because her hub is in la her hub is in la yeah because it's a good hub to have it's crazy. Okay. So you went to Mexico again. Do you remember that where? That was a shit show. I Cancun. bet it was. You guys on spring break, give me a break. That was a miracle. It was a miracle that I lived through that week. Wow. And I have been through a lot together. Do you want to share any stories from that time or is it mostly just blank? No, I mean, it's not blank, but it was not great either. I, it was, we went down, her mom was our chaperone and like all, we were kind of the outsiders of, you know, there were like the cool groups and they had hotels at resorts and we rented like a little place with their mom. We were always like the out, we were always going, they were all like, prom king and playing sports and and i were going downtown to minneapolis to go to shows with 20 year olds right you know and right 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 we were you were kind of the we were not we were kind of artsy and right but so this was still like a group of people went from your high school when it I was like because a lot of times you think it's spring break and it's college so you guys were young yeah for spring break the spring break crowd no, it's pretty common for 18-year-olds to go down there okay. once you're 18 and, and celebrate senior year. That was very common in the Midwest. Okay. It was so, a super, com- like everyone from our senior year, I mean, even my ex-boyfriend from a private school and his whole class, was they were all going down. So all the private school kids we knew were also down there at the same time. Okay. It was just a common trip. So it was still like a bunch of people like from your 
high school high school you that you knew even yeah you, oh yeah, yeah 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 okay and i'm still friends with to mm-hmm, this day mm-hmm. because my gosh but the funniest thing <laughs> was that the at one of the hotels we were hanging out with one day we were there and we were all drinking and the police came and they arrested the bartender for selling cocaine oh and so we took over the bar <laughs> and started bartending and it was a freaking shenanigans Uh, (laughs) and i ended up bringing she just by the end of the night she was like we should beep out her name and protect the innocent but by the end of the night she was sitting on one of the dad's laps like one of the dad chaperones for one of the dudes we were on some bus going somewhere i don't know where and She was so blacked out. I ended up having to bring her back to her house. And when I brought her back, she just was, she was like on the front stoop and her mom was there and she just kept going, hola, (laughs) fuck, (laughs) over and over again. I was like, "Uh, good luck with that. Um, And I ended up going back out and I probably shouldn't have. I mean, it's, it's a miracle I ended up, it's a miracle I didn't. I there is mostly just black from that trip, yeah. but it's a miracle you weren't like kidnapped and sex trafficked who or something. Who freaking knows? Yeah, I don't. I I might have been and uh. <laughs> like gotten rescued. I wouldn't even know it. I wouldn't even remember. It was a big, and I was still pining for my ex boyfriend. I think whose heart I broke. And oh, was this when you went back to Minnesota after spending like six months in Rhode Island? Was that when you did that? Your senior year. Maybe. I mean, it must have been. It must have been. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It must have been. That's when you dated the guy whose heart you broke, right? Or Mm, not? No. No. This was later. Okay. We have a hard time with nailing down actual timelines. No. This was the guy whose heart I broke my sophomore year. Oh, okay. Someone, uh, yes, in Minnesota. Yeah. He was like my first love, Uh my first real love. Okay, so you survived your second trip to Mexico, and then, then <laughs> and then what? barely survived my third one. <laughs> then you went back to Mexico again. Yeah, I never. What was I? I grew up fancying myself a world traveler, mm-hmm. and I would come home every single day from school for a while. There was a a long time in my life where I I was obsessed with Egypt. I was obsessed with India and there was this one video that we had and it was the great cities of Europe and I would come home every day after school and watch it obsessively. Wow. I was probably like 15 and I watched this thing probably 7,000 times <laughs> <laughs> and it was like Vienna and France and London but it had the choir boys and it would just show you the great cities of Europe and what they were famous for and I was I figured in my mind, it's so funny, this whole like past two days or week has been me reliving all of those abandoned dreams uh-huh. and and remembering really like fiercely what they were and going to college. I, I imagined I would go to college and go study abroad and I would, I got accepted to a program in Europe. I, I had a lot of opportunities that I just was not uh, allowed to capitalize on a sometimes Mm -hmm. and i would watch this and just i never got to travel i went to i just never had the money i never made it a priority i was always after i didn't go to college i was pretty much just on my own trying to figure it out and i'm mad that i didn't like things that i learned about traveling like you can go i could have gone to australia for years and worked there uh, but i was the year I figured that out was the the cutoff for that age. It's like 31. Oh. And there are all kinds of programs that they offer to people all over the world, especially if you're yeah. young. And I just didn't even think to, I was just too busy trying to survive, make ends meet. Yeah. yeah. And also just drinking and stuff. So there's that. So then I went and got certified in yoga during the dark years. And that was probably around... I was probably 25. Yeah, you were, your marriage was coming to an end. Yeah. And I was, we, 
spent the last week of our certification in Mexico Mm -hmm. doing a lot of our training and just the final hours. And it was probably just an excuse for my yoga instructor to go to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that was a shit show. (laughs) Shit show. (laughs) That was on the West Coast. You flew into Puerto Vallarta and then drove two or three hours north to this tiny little gated community that was right on the Pacific. Uh Uh-huh. And it was, we flew from, I think, Boston to Mexico City. Uh And then our flight got delayed by 13 hours in Mexico City. And I, mind you, this was around the time that I was suffering like debilitating and crippling anxiety. Uh It was the beginning of starting to feel that anxiety. And then we were stuck in the airport and we were, I was just trying to do yoga just to stay sane. We got on the flight and the guy next to me, it wasn't even me, he spilled a beer all over me during the flight. Oh. And I don't know how this happened to this day. I still have no idea. I don't know what I was doing or what happened. It was like <laughs> time warp. So you had to get on a tram and we were running late for our our flight. This happened to Mexico City. So we landed in Mexico City and you take a tram and we were trying to get to our flight to get to Puerto Vallarta. Uh And um, I was with like four other girls and we were just scattered throughout the plane. (laughs) And they take you from this tram back to the airport, which is massive and very confusing. And... I looked down and was gathering my things and then I looked up and everyone was loaded off the plane and the tram had left. <gasps> and they were like, oh my God. What are you doing here? <laughs> this, this, so then I had to wait until they came to get the freaking crew and at this point I'm completely separated and I was just running around the Mexico airport, <laughs> Mexico City airport going, ayudame, ayudame. Uh, like I didn't know where to go. I didn't know... It, all of my eight years of Spanish completely failed me Uh because I was so panicked that I was going to miss my flight because then we had a driver. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do or who I'm going to call or we didn't have cell phones. I didn't know how I was going to find them or go to. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of panicking. Yeah. And smell like beer. So they think that I was just drunk. I I wasn't though. (laughs) Irony of all ironies. I don't remember what, I don't know how this happened. They just didn't see me. It was so crazy. Right. I also don't know what the hell I was doing. Right. The time passed and the (laughs) plane completely emptied. emptied. How long does that take? (laughs) Well, maybe I was sleeping. I don't know. I I don't know. Wow. And I look up and everyone's gone. It was crazy. Wow. That's so panic inducing. Oh, it was. I remember being, it was, I definitely felt that panic of like I couldn't think clearly Uh and so I'm trying to find my way and navigate around and then I finally find the desk and I'm waiting in line and all these Americans are acting like the ugly Americans that you hear about and they're like this and 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 I'm like no one gives a shit you're in Mexico like they don't care Uh and I started calming down because I just was like all right Mexico every time I've come to this freaking country it's challenged me so this is just it pushing my buttons and I remember you wrote you wrote about this on Fantasy, my, I think. I think I wrote about it in my journal or, too. Yeah, I remember reading this the, the story about this trip. I remember the ugly Americans in the airport. You wrote about them specifically and kind of their conversation and I can't remember what yeah, it was. Yeah, they were so It was I, so like, ugh, <laughs> cringy. It was bad. And then uh I ma- magically my crew appeared. I turned around and then there they were. They had the planes had all been delayed. And because I just figured they, when I got to that place, the plane was taking off. And I was like, oh, they were on that plane. Oh, wow. But they hadn't been able to find it and missed it as well. And so they just magically appeared. And then we had to wait 13 hours for the next plane. Wow. And I don't even know how we let our yoga instructor know that. She was already there at the villa. Oh, and wow. that place was so sick. And then we finally got there. It was the middle of the night. We get in a sketchy car with someone and then drive through these tiny little villages 
in these windy roads through the mountains that were terrifying and I'm like, we're gonna die. Uh-huh. We're one hundred percent gonna die to this villa and it was um a terrifying ride but also kind of it, it, the whole thing was just that whole trip was kind of magical but also definitely pushed my edges a lot yeah which i think you you liked a lot when you came back and had time to process it you were like i you liked having your edges pushed yeah well that's what i like about traveling mm-hmm. i like having to figure out all that stuff. Right. And because dealing it, with the crises that arise. It is a challenge too. Just the currencies and the and the schedules and the bus schedules and whatever. Just trying to figure out how things work in the country is a challenge and invigorating and, and exhilarating. And then I got back and I went to Chicago very last minute for New Year's. And my good friend from high school, who is also down in Mexico with us in Cancun, and one of our really close friends, happened to be opening a desk in Japan for one of his, he was working high up at a um, and Wall Street. Mm-hmm. And so somebody had, he was going to Tokyo and kind of threw it out there. He's like, hey, I have this place in Rapongi. why don't you come? And I, ne- Japan was never on my radar. It right. wasn't one of those places that, I like Egypt or Europe that I was like, I have to go. I never thought it would be the first country outside of Mexico Uh that I would go to. Uh (laughs) And right. And you just jumped on it. I remember you being like, I'm going to Japan. I did. But I was at that Chicago airport is where I had the worst panic attack I've ever had in my life. And it was coming back to, I think it was just, I was, not able to face the fact that my marriage was over and I didn't, it was just that I feeling of lying to myself, but I'd started getting really bad hypochondria and anxiety. And then it just loops in your brain and you start becoming afraid of it. And this was, a, it was a, such a bad, I sweat through three shirts sitting in that airport Oof. and my plane kept getting delayed. And it was, I can't believe I even got on the little mini plane because they kept changing. It was just, it was the whole thing. And I was experiencing such debilitating hypochondria and anxiety. I'm like, I can't live like this. Mm. I will freaking kill myself. I will take depression over anxiety any day of the week. Mm. Any, because it's not so heart rate inducing. And right. I f- depression is terrifying and horrible for different reasons, but... It's not living in a state of panic. It's just anxiety is so it's like being a victim of your own mind. Uh-huh. It really feels like your mind is trying to kill you. Uh-huh. And I didn't know how to get on top of it. And I just was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I was supposed to go with my yoga instructor who canceled last minute. And I was like, I'm just going to book this ticket and go. And I'm either going to go crazy because I was having a lot of fear around flying which I had never had ever in my life Mm -hmm. and I'm like I'm gonna either put myself in this tube and go insane and end up in a straitjacket in Japan (laughs) or I'm going to just you know it was like uh, exposure therapy or something I just like put myself in such a high stress situation and I I was leaving out of New York And the night before I took the train and stayed with a friend and the night before I left, I got so sick, like violently ill. Uh And I think I actually did get sick, like the flu or something. I thought it was just nerves because I threw up. Uh But then I was on the plane and when I got there, I was sick. I'm I'm surprised they even let me in Japan because I'm pretty sure I had a fever. Uh I was and I was burning up and i think the first day i was there i we were supposed to go do something cool and i couldn't do it because i was i was actually sick and had to just sleep but we were staying in a sweet spot and he was working every day all day and had dinners at night and had to entertain clients and all that stuff and so i was just it was like that movie lost in translation only i didn't sit in the hotel room the whole time (laughs) and i went just explored tokyo by myself Uh like by and large every single day that i was there i just went on a different adventure to a different part of the had you done some research did you were not really i did just like kind of on the ground being like of hearing about what's cool or asking people what tokyo well it's funny because i met on the flight there 
I met this DJ. You and always it, meet people on planes. And then another dude who was, he was this, he worked at Burton. He was a designer at Burton, which like a clothes designer, it's a snowboarding company and there's mm-hmm. a big snowboard community in Japan. Mm-hmm. And so he was moving there to work. And then there was this d- random DJ that I befriended who was kind of just up and about. And the guy from Burton and I kind of stayed in touch, but he was in kind of the underground cool scene. And one time I ended up going out with him and we smoked weed and I was so fucking high. And then we, I ended up going out with my friend I was staying with, but we did all these insanely cool things. We went to this one hotel where this massive, it was a wall that opened and then you walked in and there was this jazz player but there was like a quartet. It was just a, probably a Ritz Carlton or some beautiful. It was crazy. And then from there, we went to this club. And the DJ that I met was there. <laughs> and I walked in. I was like, oh, hey, what's up, buddy? And my friend's like, of course, you know the fucking DJ. <laughs> like, of course. This is so typical, Bridget. <laughs> of course, you know the DJ at the like hottest club in, in Japan, in Tokyo <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. And that was fun. It was just funny. Uh-huh. I was like, oh my God, it's my buddy. Uh-huh. So that's, that's th- awesome. And I was just so, it was, it, I, I mean, talk about anxiety, but that was, we went to Kyoto, which was amazing. Amazing. I want to go back there so badly. It is one of the ro- most romantic cities and just old. And Tokyo so slick and, young and it's a new city and it's so there's so much order to their chaos Mm. it's just a culture that i fell in love with i could have and then i met these guys and they were wall street dudes and they were gonna fund me to open a yoga studio and i I don't know i was there's every country i've gone to i've wanted to move to Uh that's just my thing i'm like i'm moving here Uh uh-huh Every, every, literally every country. Uh-huh. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Finding the perfect present for mom is tough, especially if you don't have the luxury of celebrating Mother's Day together in person. This year, with social distancing and people not flying, it makes it very difficult to spend the holiday with our mothers or the people who we think of as our mothers. It's not always our biological mom. I know that more than anything, parents cherish spending time with family. That's why I'm giving my mom the most meaningful gift this year, a chance to connect with loved ones through StoryWorth. StoryWorth is a fun and meaningful way to engage with family, especially with relatives you might not get to see often. This online service helps your loved ones share stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. It's a gift of spending time together wherever you live. Every week, StoryWorth emails your family member different story prompts, questions you've never thought to ask, like what have been some of your life's greatest surprises? And what's one of the riskiest things you've ever done? Or what are your regrets? What are your biggest fears? Reading the weekly stories is fun and makes our family feel close, even if we're not together. This Mother's Day, StoryWorth is the perfect gift for your mother or anyone who might be functioning as a mother in your life. Get to know the person who isn't the mother, the stories of their life that might have occurred before you ever existed. Sometimes it's funny to think of our parents having lives before we were born. It's fascinating to hear about their travels, things that they've done, experienced, crazy things they risked. I love hearing those stories and StoryWorth is a great place to collect them. Get the collections of memories from your parents, grandparents, and the mothers in your lives. After one year, StoryWorth will compile every answered question and photo you choose to include into a beautiful keepsake book that ship for free. Give your mom the most meaningful gift this year, or anyone in your family, with StoryWorth. Get started right away without the need for shipping by going to storyworth.com slash walk-ins. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash walk-ins for $10 off. Wasn't there an experience that you had, though, where you were like your sixth sense kicked in or something and you were like... uh, Oh, yeah, there was a weird... I was alone in a weird part of Tokyo and I'd been kind of warned... 
just to like watch it and that if men that men will just like surround you and kind of herd you off into places and God know you'll yeah. won't be seen again or who knows what. Especially as a small woman wandering a Western around. Western woman. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I don't know if it was the like mafia or what. I really don't know. I just been warned to be aware of that. And at one point I was in this kind of dodgy part of town and I was wandering around. I think I got lost and all of a sudden I felt that sensation of like being hurted. hurted. Yeah. And I just bolted I bolted into the middle of traffic and like ran away. And I don't I don't wow. know if it was true or, or just me being paranoid, but it was definitely like all of a sudden I felt just being and then when I was in freaking Spain, oh, I totally forgot about Spain. This was, I guess I went to Spain before I went to, did I go to Spain before or after Japan? I think after. I think it was after. I think Japan was your first big major. Yeah, it was Spain. Spain was after. And when I was in Spain, some old man tried to grab me and pull me into an alley. And I was like, I had to hit him in his ribs Yikes. to let him have me let, to let me go. But he was old. He was like an elderly man. <laughs> trying to kidnap me <laughs> you are very good at your your kind of crowd awareness is good you have a you have a good sense of probably because the freaking dudes tried to throw me in a trunk when i was rollerblading when i was like 14 years old in minnesota uh-huh that was terrifying god you've had some strange experiences and then there was that time at the beach that you had you and your friend had a bunch of money on you for some reason he was an idiot <laughs> Who you were like, fucking run. <laughs> $2,000 in their pocket at fucking Venice Beach. Ugh. And they, this kid was acting so sketchy. He was like a, a young kid. And he was at, he just was like pacing. And he had a hoodie on. And he was just acting freaking weird. And I was like, buddy of mine. I'm like, something's not right. This kid's like a scout. There's just something. And he was acting all free and dancing like a lunatic because he was an actor. Uh-huh. And I'm like... And it was the sun was setting and no one was on the beach around us. No one. Uh-huh. There was no one in sight. It was just the two of us. And he had $2,000 in his pocket because he's an idiot. Uh-huh. I'm like, people can smell this from miles away. Uh-huh. But that weren't, wasn't there like three guys who yeah. had masks on or and something? they were coming from two sides. Yeah. And I was like, I'm like, we're going. I'm going. I'm leaving you here. I'm going. And the kid kept being like, hey, mister, hey, mister, hey, mister, and trying to get us to stay. And uh-huh. I was like, and I'm like, run, because the people started running. And I just bolted like all the way back to his place. I never even <laughs> looked back. God. I just saw the little kid like looking over at the dudes because there were these two dudes and I was just aware of them the whole time. And they were just on the lifeguard stand because uh-huh. it was after the lifeguards had left. Uh-huh. And then there was another dude like on the other lifeguard stand on the left. And then this kid was just acting weird. freaking weird. And you were like, I you realized you couldn't see their faces or something. And, and they were their faces were blurred because they had masks. Yeah, on they had like little. Ugh. Yeah, that was bad too. Not bad, but it was another one of those things where my spidey sense was yeah, just you like, have get a good, out. You have good instincts for that. I trust I'm not going to wait around for, for some freaking oblivious dude to get me mugged and killed or right, whatever. Right. I, I, Men are oblivious to that they shit are. because they don't have to live in constant fear because they're not prey. They don't have to be as aware. No. Yeah. So I don't trust men around me at all. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no. Unless you're like a Marine. And you have you martial have arts zero training. zero situational awareness. <laughs> yeah. you, like, men don't notice shit. Uh-huh. Shit. Uh-huh. It's Not true. all, but m- many. Unless, unless they practice it or they're trained in it. Mm-hmm. Or they train themselves in it. But for the most part, they're just oblivious. Mm-hmm. No, but that's why I trust your instincts when you say you were being herded somewhere and japan i'm like yeah you probably were and you probably surprised the hell out of them when you bolted i like <laughs> bolted in the middle of traffic i'm lucky i didn't get it. that's two times in my life that i've chosen to take my chances with traffic over uh ending up in a trunk what was the other time when i was rollerblading oh, well you got to tell that story because now you've alluded to it twice i was rollerblading alone and i was when you rollerblade it was again it was like in the evening and i probably shouldn't have been rollerblading alone at 14 and or 15 but there 
there were little inlets in the around this lake where people would park and mm-hmm. it was again no one was around and there were these i was rollerblading up and i saw this car pull in it was kind of like behind me and it, I, it pulled in and two guys jumped out and opened the trunk and two guys jumped out and started chasing me oh my god and i have never rollerbladed so fast in my life and but i was fast i'd been roller it was like right. how i got around when i was before i got my license forever right and and then i just they kept on following me and i just bolted into the middle of traffic where there were like cars were like beeping and i was like help help oh my god <laughs> and then they ran away and just went off once I got the attention oh, of people in cars. You have, you've had some near misses in your life. That's why I still don't count. I, I still knock on wood. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's even just all the traveling I've done. Even when I was in India, I th- I remember when I took that bus across India and you there wasn't a it was a 15 hour long bus ride through the middle, the south of the country. Indians don't even take this bus. I've come to find out. Uh-huh. They're like, they we don't even take this, do this bus ride, you lunatic. Uh-huh. And I had my period and I had to go to the bathroom to like, and everything, you know, it's a culture that's so modest. It's, you have to be super aware of, you just can't be like changing your tampon on the bus right you know right. with like 70 indian men right and, and me and yeah. my friend who was girl who was like a foot shorter than me oh my god and we i was you know they're all just like bus stops and holes in the ground and i'm like i could disappear uh-huh. right now uh-huh. and there would be no trace ever yeah ever again you would you would hear that i was there but you would never know where i ended up uh-huh all right, well, let's get back to the storyline here. So you went to, you were in Japan, and I remember when you came home, I think, is that really when the travel bug really bit you, like, latched it back on again? Because after that, I, you were just constantly taking advantage of any any opportunity that came up to travel. Yeah, I went, um, well, then my, this friend of mine who was a bartender for one summer ended up, same thing, he was going to business school, ESE or something in Barcelona Mm -hmm. and he's like oh we have a flat and I'm definitely one of those people that if you offer me your international lodging I will show up on your door Uh and he was staying with two other guys and a place that I ended up cleaning because it was disgusting (laughs) I clean everywhere I go Uh and cook and um I went for like two weeks to Barcelona and I was meant to go to Madrid but I never got out of Barcelona. I loved it so much. Your pictures from there were amazing. I loved Barcelona so much. I loved it. I loved Spain. I mean, it was it was a weird time to be in Europe. There was a very high anti-American sentiment. Uh-huh. It was right after the we invaded Iraq. They just it was the post 9/11 kind of feel goodness had worn off. It was 2005 and it was and so I found myself being uh, defensive of America because I was raised, it, it's weird too. I was just talking about this the other day. My mom is very like loved Europe mm-hmm. to the point that she kind of glamorized that or just held it up as an ideal way to live and an ideal culture growing mm-hmm. up mm-hmm. and really said to us, I don't want you guys to be like normal Americans who think America is the center of the world Mm -hmm. and kind of look down on America. Uh And it was a kind like this sentiment is very strong now, but my mom was like way ahead of that liberal anti-American sentiment. Right. She, she just didn't have that same. And then on the other hand with my father and our family, it was like an intensely patriotic sense. Right. Because of, World War Two and Grandpa being in the military and just they loved America, right? Loved it. And my dad loves America and the Fourth of July and just so much pride and the United States. So I grew up with a good balance in some ways, but in some ways it pitted me at war with myself. Uh huh. And it was very clear to me when I was in Barcelona because I had really held up this European ideal. 
Uh-huh. And then I got there and they were being such douchebags. And I, w- I was drinking still and feisty. And there were all these like chauvinistic Spanish dudes. Uh-huh. And also arrogant, rich Spanish dudes because they were going to this business school. So they were the upper class. Like we went to w- watch the Madrid Barcelona um, football match uh-huh. at this dude's house and the entire roof opened into where we watched the game oh into God. like on the screen this huge screen and the whole thing retracted back so you could be sitting under the like feeling you like know, you were in a stadium yeah. sky um of their rooftop deck or whatever and they were just kind of always condescending and snarky and uh at one point this guy was talking shit about america and i'm like Give me your Nikes. Give me your iPad <laughs> or your iPod or whatever you had. Like I'm like, you are head to toe America right now. Uh-huh. All of his brands, his Levi's, everything. I uh-huh. was like, fine, shit on America all you want, but like, give me everything from every brand that is from America right now uh-huh. on your body. Uh-huh. Like, if you're gonna shit on America, please give me. Like you look ridiculous. Don't be a hypocrite about it. Yeah. So I found myself being more proud well not proud but it's like i can make fun of my family but you can't right right i remember you I, you wrote about this too when you came back you because you were so good about writing about all this stuff on fantasy when you your if travels only and everything it still existed um and you definitely i remember you it, there was one specific gathering where you were just describing your interactions with these people and and just the feeling too of of like elitism in their kind of, oh, we're going to this business school and aren't we just so amazing? (laughs) Yeah, and I felt very, I felt very insecure over there Mm -hmm. and more so, and I mind you, I had just been in Japan, which is an extremely loving and polite culture. So even if they're talking shit about you, they wouldn't do it so blatantly Mm -hmm. and in spain the the men in particular the spanish women were amazing i made a very good friend who i'm still friends with and she kind of salvaged that trip for me because the spanish men and then the guys that i was staying with were all expats who were staying there going to the business school but it was like a guy from they were all european and they just there's so much looking down your nose at americans from europe Mm -hmm. Which in some cases is rightfully so, but in other cases you're kind of like, really, Germany? <laughs> you're gonna, you're really gonna uh-huh. take that stance with us right now? You still haven't made up all your ground, Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, haven't we bailed your ass out? Like, <laughs> haven't we beat your ass twice? And what about you, France? <laughs> Shouldn't you still be thanking us? Um, yeah, this was when we were calling them Freedom Fries, wasn't it? It was around then. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was definitely, it was interesting to be traveling. So I was very disillusioned by that trip mm-hmm. about my, my idealism was shattered. Yeah. My idealistic vision of Europe and Europeans was kind of shattered and also just so nationalist in Europe. And so they're all, you know, every individual country is so. Even seeing the pandemic that during the pandemic, it is so fun how quickly the euro the euro kind of disintegrated into the, the individual yeah. yeah the EU into their individual countries. Mm-hmm. Um, the minute this happened, everybody like sealed their borders. Their borders. That's I mean yeah. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just funny that it in this you know one of the metaphors people always used when we were talking about Brexit was that with the euro you you know and and the eu you can't it's like trying to undo an omelet Mm -hmm. but in this instance i've i'm like well apparently you can undo an omelet (laughs) because they pretty much just did right but it it was a yeah I, i loved it i had Many same thing that happened to me in Tokyo where I would be in these I went and ate probably one of the best sushi meals of my life alone at the top of this restaurant. It was a place that these people told me I had to go and I overlooked all of Tokyo and I was all by myself. And I just remember being just so blown away, all the like blinking red lights and just in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And then 
feeling this. I mean, Scotty and I talked about this when he was on just that like loneliness. <laughs> this, like, uh, and he yeah. never feels he's like, uh-huh. I never felt that. Um, but I would feel like, oh, I turn around and you're like, if only there was someone I could share this with. And there's that because as much as I could write about it or take a picture or paint or anything, there's nothing like experiencing that right. moment together right. with someone. And then same thing in Barcelona. There were moments where I was on top of the, um, is it the El Sagrada, the church? They've been under construction forever. I don't know. I think I I, I might be mistaking that. And again, looking out over the entire city of Barcelona, a city whose history is just, it's been like burned and raised over and over uh-huh. again. Without, Rebuilt. Yeah, and, you yeah. just feel that over in Europe. It's you do. such an old country Mm -hmm. you feel those layers of history i did at least Mm -hmm. just so deeply in my soul the culture is old yeah it's an older culture and Mm -hmm. so they're more chill about shit yeah in a lot of respects they've seen a lot of shit it's like i always say they've seen a lot of titties in their time (laughs) it's why they're not weird about nudity (laughs) they're like whatever yeah other than the brits they're still stuffy so then I came back from Spain. And I don't think I went anywhere for a very long t- time after that. No, because I think that's when eventually we moved to LA or we, Park City and then LA. And then I don't know that you went anywhere till your big giant no, I globe didn't. trot. Which we, we kind of are, we're almost at our hour mark. Yeah, We've we got should about just 10 do part minutes. one. So um, this is kind of like the warm up, I guess, of Bridget's, the rest of Bridget's travels. But uh, you started laying the groundwork for your travels, I think, w- by joining couchsurfer.com and kind of building up credit. Yeah. Uh, uh, on your, because you had well, a lot of people come through your apartment, just a lot of travel. Because then I moved here and this has always been the war. Again, I'm, I'm constantly, one of the hardest things about kind of, unyoking myself from tradition at age 19 by massively failing and ending up in rehab and deciding to kind of write my own ticket and life is that I face constant indecision about what path I should go down when many opportunities presented themselves. Mm -hmm. And there was that one time and I wrote everything where it was like, should I do, you know, stay here and grind and do stand up? Should I become, go teach English as a second language and be a writer? Or should I stay here and work with autistic kids and teach yoga? And that kind of all worked itself out because Uh my online persona collided with my real life, my real life job. And then I had to make that choice, which is a whole other story for almost for a different time. But I still, wake up every day and ask myself why I'm in America Mm. because I, and I love America. I think every single time I came back from another country, I kissed the ground because it's still even Europe. It's still just an amazing country to return to. And, but I think part of me has always fancied myself an expat. Mm -hmm. I just wish that I was viewing a, a lot of the stuff And that's what I love about traveling is that it gives you that other perspective. You see the news, the way it's being reported from another country. It was great when I was in New Zealand and seeing the way American news is reported on from the rest of the world. It's fucking ridiculous. But it gives you a perspective. And that's like we were talking about this with the pandemic. People in America, because we're so invested in politics and the culture war, it's like they forget that this is happening all over the world. Yeah. Like this isn't just happening here, guys. Not that that makes it any better or worse, but it's still, it's not like this is just happening to us and it's this big conspiracy. To It's happening everywhere and every culture is dealing with it differently in every country. And yeah, there's still so much I want to see. There's mm-hmm. still, I'm still at, I I mean, today I've just, this morning in between writing, I was cooking and I'm like, God, I just want to move to Italy. And I've been watching Medici. So of course I'm like, just want to go move to Tuscany and uh-huh. like live there uh-huh. <laughs> and bake bread and eat bruschetta and learn Italian and write. Uh-huh. And that's it. And I, and I actually could. Yeah. There's no reason that I couldn't actually do that. Right. But then there are reasons like dumpster fire and comedy 
And I remember being on a beach in New Zealand and wanting to, it's so funny. There's this beach in New Zealand and I, I vividly, I had been, I had been traveling around and I was deciding again, the indecision was killing me. Do I come back? Do I stay? And stand up had been just chasing me and every single, the whole time I was in Australia, the whole time I was in New Zealand and I was on this beach and I was all alone and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back. I need to just, I will kill myself if I, I'll regret it if I don't at least give this my all and give it a chance. And when I'm running at the gym, there are all these pre-programmed places. And this one run I always do is through all of New Zealand and it ends on that beach. Oh my God. That same freaking beach. And I'm always like, this is a beach that I decided I needed to come back and be here. Uh Just a weird, weird thing. And, but I still, I don't know. You still got the travel yearn. Yeah. And and maybe, and generally when I'm feeling like moving to another country, it's because I haven't. And unfortunately, I was about to go international. I really wanted to go to Israel. I've been Mm -hmm. dying to go. Mm -hmm. And before this, I was. You were planning on. Yeah. Planning on going this summer in June. Mm -hmm. And so now with the pandemic that changes all all things right because you try you you, every, you always make it as a goal to get out of the country once a year but it's Usually like every it's two years like every two years yeah, and but, now it's been it's been three years now mm. which is unfortunate going on four years wow yeah yeah it will be four years of summer which is way too long yeah but i've been building right. and that's what so anyway back to i was at this little dive bar where we always used to eat um when we were hung over in sri lanka and my friend from that i had met when i was in australia came and visited me in sri lanka and he was like at a certain point you're gonna have to decide whether you want to stay put and build or whether you want to just be a wanderer but you can't really do both Mm -hmm. and i remember vividly vividly where I was sitting, what I was eating, what I was wearing when we had that conversation because it really, I think it made me come back and I I left to go to, you know, London and, Ireland. and Ireland. But other than that, I've been just in that building. building. Yeah, and you have been building. You have been. It's hard. You can't build no, traveling. No, you need you, stability. Yeah. It's this crazy thing I've never had. No. And you, you always would run away from it too. You'd, whenever you would finally get stable, you'd uproot your life because yep. that was what you'd learned in childhood. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's why I won't hang pictures on my walls. But now and I do. Look at all the pictures you've got hung up now. But now I do. Yeah, well, that's... That's all right, kind so of phase one. This is phase one, Bridget's travel stories. There are many more to come. She de- then did like a year of traveling. Like uh, two years. It was, well, I did a year and, and then, then came, came back, back and, and then, then there was the, went like another six months or something. I wasn't going to go though. And then there was the shooting, the kit, the one of all the little kids. Uh-huh. And I could not even look at it. I just booked a ticket. Uh-huh. I was like, I can't, I don't want to, I hate this. I don't want to be here. Uh-huh. I couldn't even look at uh-huh. it. I couldn't face it. I booked a ticket and I was like, I don't want I'm to going. be online. I just, yeah. I went to the first third world country that I could get Fine. my ass to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, very many stories to come. We'll do another one of these probably soon. We should try and do it soon while we're still in this zone of talking about it. I mean, we can, yeah, we can record, yeah. We can record it, certainly. But, yes, any final, like, what's your number one travel tip for anyone out there? Like, number one, first thing, top of your head, like, if you're traveling internationally, what should you do? Mm, That's a good question. I don't know. Let me think. Even if it's just like something that's essential for you to bring or something that like planning wise or like, you know, once- I mean, anyone who travels kind of has the same. I, I we I've joked about this with people with the passport anxiety uh-huh. where you just are constantly you'll check your passport and check it. And it's just life got a lot easier for me when I got those one of those little under your skirt or pants like fanny packs where you could put your passport and cash and uh-huh. because you don't really need anything in another country other than money in your passport mm-hmm. and so as for me those, those were things. always my yeah. priority that i had them or i had access to them or knew and i would say it also just depends how you're traveling and and where you're traveling mm-hmm. so that 
The number one thing really though is just always know where your passport is. Mm-hmm. Always. Mm-hmm. It's just good tip. Yeah. Common sense, but good tip. I just always knew where my passport was. For people was. who don't travel a lot too, it's it's kind of, I remember being super paranoid about mine when I went to Italy. I was like, we're always just like, I knew exactly where it was. I yeah. had a place I kept it. I knew. Yeah, you don't want to lose that while you're right. in another country. And then you have copies of it like emailed to yourself or something. Yeah. yeah. And just respect the fact that you're not, in your home country, mm. which I feel like is an obvious thing to say until I travel and see the way that Australians and Americans behave, and I'm shocked. Mm-hmm. It's just the entitlement. You're not. Do Australians do that too? Oh or? my gosh, I think they're like the new Americans. Oh really? Yeah, they were. They really kind of took over in terms of just being obnoxious travelers. Huh. Right, it's recognizing the fact like, oh, I'm not in my country. Things aren't going to work the same way. This is Be respectful. Not, yeah. Try not to be a loud douchebag and an entitled uh, really Karen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your time this evening, Bridget. Thank you, Maggie. It was a lot of fun. I love hearing stories I've never heard before from you. <laughs> I can't believe there that are any left. Trunk story was new. <laughs> <laughs> At the very least. It's funny because I totally forgot about it until the other day I was telling someone about it. <laughs> it's just come up twice now. Yep. All right. Until next time. Bye. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Are you ready? I'm reading a poem about Scorpios. We're recording. She stands in her fullness within the darkness of night. Her gaze, our mirror, reflecting all that we are. We cannot obscure the steadiness of her light. In Scorpio. Full moon in Scorpio. Yeah. I've been really looking at the moon, thinking a lot about um, how everybody has looked at the moon before me, unless they were blind, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Thinking about all the billions and billions of people in humanity's history who looked at the moon. Because I've been binge watching Medici. Ah. And I had that very distinct feeling when I was in Rome. I was like, holy shit, so many people have looked at the moon from here. Right, right. That's crazy. And like written poems about the moon (laughs) and and just songs. Yeah. And and labored under the boot of rich people. (laughs) Pirates tyranny, and And the Pope done dances and worshipped it. Oh, the Pope's. Well, maybe we should just start with the check-in then uh, before we dive into story hour. Into story hour. You've been busy writing. I know. I'm kind of tweaked out. Yeah. And I got like two hours of sleep last night because I'm in a bread cycle. (laughs) (laughs) A bread cycle? (laughs) Well, now I try to match up my bread cycles with my writing cycles because if I have to be up late at night, I might as well be baking bread. Well, no, the bread keeps me up. Oh, the bread is the priority. So then you work in your writing (laughs) around your bread. Because then I'm like, well, I have to be up to like babysit this bread because I still haven't really figured the timing out. Maggie's got wire I'm tangled right now. Okay, there we go. Um... Yikes. And you, but you've been writing some pieces. You've been on deadline the last few days, so... Yeah, and then I keep pitching them. They keep getting accepted. <laughs> good and problems I've been, to have. They're really good problems to have. And I don't. And I've been so hard on myself about not taking that for granted uh-huh. because I uh-huh. know that it's very. I'm very lucky. Right. I'm very, 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 very lucky, and I never want to spit in the face of that. That's why I really always try to meet my deadlines, even though I know all my editors lie to me and <laughs> tell me they that they have my, to. <laughs> That's smart. All editors do Oh, yeah, they should. They know writers. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, your deadline's hard deadline Wednesday. And then I'm like, oh, um," and then they'll ask me to write something else for the internet or something instead of the magazine, Spectator. And suddenly my deadline's Friday. Uh uh (laughs) And I'm like, I know it. Still, it's good. You need the hard deadline in your mind without any give because you're you're always willing to push it. It's it's a writer thing. It's totally a writer thing. It has to be. I was saying this last night. I'm like, I think writers are all an inherently lazy. And, but <laughs> it's that procrastination. Like you and I have talked about this. It's that procrastination of like, I would 
postpone an essay and or a paper I had to write until the last m- possible minute because I needed the pressure to just crank it out. Yeah. Somebody said that to me when I was writing for Playboy that the pressure of a weekly column forces a certain amount of clarity because you can't you it is that pressure that like pushes through Mm -hmm. and i mean i can't write anything without a deadline no i've been trying to write a book for 20 years i know i'm literally not gonna write a book until someone pays me Uh uh-huh like a big chunk of money to write a book no i'm (laughs) dicking around writing a book right now being like tra la la like i i've got to get back to it i was reading this part 36 pages of a book that i wrote when i was 24 years old and i'm like god i've been writing this book for like 20 years Uh uh-huh uh-huh. And I said that to Joe Donatelli today. We were in the DMs and I said, I've been writing my book for 20 years. And he's like, well, that's good because most books suck. <laughs> I was like, that makes me feel a little it's better. It's true. No, and I mean, you have to also give yourself, be compassionate with yourself because I know you always appreciate like the fact that you're working and can survive as a writer because that was a dream of yours that you've worked very hard to accomplish. But writing is hard. Writing... Yeah. Call, it can be really hard and kind of like soul searching and, yeah. and difficult sometimes. The recent piece I wrote, it, I cried when I wrote it. Mm-hmm. And it's rare that that happens. But because those are always the pieces I like the most, the ones that I write. And then they make me want to write a piece about writing the piece or like go journal about writing the piece. Mm-hmm. And the really good pieces, I think, are too, always to a piece within a piece. There's always a piece within a piece. There's the piece, and then there's the what you went through to write that piece. Right, or what I learned from that piece or whatever, yeah. what became clear for me. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's been, no, it's good. And I feel, I feel inherently, I do feel lazy. And then I was reading all of these old book chapters that i've written from waitress like all the years waiting tables Mm -hmm. and there's one where it was like a laurel laura ingles wilder detailed ver day of waiting tables i remember this i because i've read it and i wanted to fucking kill myself just after reading it Uh i was like i and it made me realize too, like I've worked really freaking hard. Right. Those years waiting tables were grueling and waiting tables for that long. It's just, it's grueling. But I remember this description of your day of even reading it of like taking out the garbage and like wiping down the menu, like just like the ins. It was, it was detailed and it was very, and I was like, holy (laughs) shit. So boring. You were working your ass off though. I know. I read that now and it's so, it was, it was, I was always bitching about how it was illegal because it was. Uh We were getting paid $2.89 an hour to basically clean the place. I was like vacuuming the booths and. And like this three story restaurant. Oh my God. Those were, those were some dark. Dark times. Dark, dark Dark times. Yeah, they were, it's definitely. But it's really good you got that down while you were in it. The I re- detail. I wanted to get it down. Even the detailed conversations. I remember writing the interactions with customers because I, I knew I'd forget. And right. they're so detailed and annoying that there's no way that they aren't anything other than exactly what you go through as a waitress. And then even just how my first table was like stalling. They wouldn't let me go and they didn't know what they wanted to order. And then you get seated a seven top and then right. it put me right there. And then it was like, Ugh. I'm screwed. I'm screwed for the rest of the day You're, because yeah. one table was selfish enough to keep me there because they didn't want to have to wait, even though they didn't know what they wanted to order. I remember those you're sitting there getting more and more stressed in your brain while you're trying to be nice to these customers. And you're like, I just got sad again. Fuck. Yeah. Like, I, oh, I, like I've got to go do this. I've got to do uh, like, you're just running through the list of shit you need to do in your head and being like, I'm screwed. I I'm really screwed. have like no, I don't think I respect anyone more than people in customer service. Mm-hmm. Be, per, like waits to any, anyone who's regularly dealing with the public like that. Who do it well and gracefully. And then I read my internal monologue that I wrote <laughs> when I was waiting tables in LA. Uh-huh. And that is, I had, I think I had just gotten sober. So it's also kind of, and my friend Henny was dying and it's dark, but it, it's like a different 
it, it's also hilarious. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I bet. Darkly, twistedly hilarious. It's just also very. There are just moments of hilarious self awareness where I'm like in my head in the internal monologue. I'm like, yeah, because no one listens. And then someone had told me uh, an <laughs> order and I was like, sorry, what did You're you like, say? Wait, like, what? I'm not listening. <laughs> yeah. And so it was just a, it was, it's just interesting to go through. I mean, it's, I've written books. Right. That's what I've realized. Even just going, because I'm trying to organize my freaking computer so I can use my new one that I haven't even touched. Uh-huh. And it's thousands and thousands of words. Uh-huh. Thousands and thousands. Yeah. Like and hundreds even, of thousands of words. Even just what I've written on Patreon alone, mm-hmm. even what I wrote on Phetasy alone before it went to France. Uh-huh. I mean... <laughs> It's just it's so madness. much writing. Yeah, even all those little blog posts that I post, there I you know, I've been keeping all my like little quarantine uh-huh. journal in one document and it's like freaking 15 pages long already. Uh-huh. It's just so much. So I give I give myself a hard time and and feel like I'm not doing enough because I know I I know I can be doing more if I was more disciplined and had a better routine. But I also know I do a lot more than maybe because it comes easily to me. It doesn't feel it and it doesn't even come easily all the time, but it's it comes naturally. Right. It doesn't feel like project writing. It's just like blah. a lot of the time for fetacy or for. Yeah. But it's still even writing pieces that I want to be good that will remain because I it's important to me that things hold up in time for the most part. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, for them to age well, Mm -hmm. but it's still just, I don't know. It's like, I'll time myself. That's when I do the best writing. And yesterday I just had, I just have to start. I'm like, I've got to finish this freaking piece. I know part of it is just me self sabotaging because it's another new byline and it's cool and it's just i i got i i need to finish this and it's an opportunity i can't pass up on Mm -hmm. and it's in my wheelhouse it's perfect Mm -hmm. and so i just start and put and also i know that like head i have to have things distracting me and put my headphones on but i'll crank out 1200 words in like two hours Mm -hmm. which is a piece, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it's like a standard. And granted, it will be, you know, I did another pro. It took me getting the notes back from a good editor. It probably took me twice as long today to fix the piece once I got notes in a line by line edit. Right. Than it did for me to write the first draft. Notes are, I mean, it, it, that's, but that's what happens. Editing takes longer. Yeah, it's and hard. That if, especially if you have a good editor, yeah. it makes such a difference. It's she was really crazy. good. Yeah. She, I like editors that push me, and I yeah. like the challenge of trying to figure out how to, how to, like when to push back, when not to push back, how to, how to accept their notes and not sell it. Right. sell out your own maintain I, the voice right yeah it's i like that challenge but it took me i mean the like the last paragraph of this piece probably took me as long as the entire piece the first draft that's good though because the last paragraph is the most important and it's always the i'm still not sure i stuck strongest, the longest but, but it's all right well i'm excited for this piece and i'm excited for our story hour which is we're about to record so anything else you want to say to your folks no but i really think my obsession with bread now that i've been watching medici is because i was a peasant in like every single past life Uh (laughs) i'm like this shit comes naturally Uh i knew it did and now i really know it does i'm starting to feel it it's like uh it is that dna that's activated in me (laughs) the peasant dna (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the bread making DNA. <laughs> the bread making peasant DNA <laughs> is strong and rigid. <laughs> it really is. Like I can't get enough of it. <laughs> just, I know. This is a new obsession for you. It's like uh, up there with your drug addiction. It's like become your new addiction. Yeah, because I love the challenge and excitement and honestly 
I really just want to make bread every day. And your bread is damn good. I've actually finally tasted but it the sourdough. Keeps getting and it's so better. good. So I'm it's she's finally she's she's achieved a level of Did I show you the ones I made today? No. Let me get my bread porn out. Look at Ooh, that. That blistering. is a perfect <laughs> perfect loaf. I know. Perfect. And it was perfect inside and I made wow. an olive a whole wheat loaf. Wow. Impressive. And it wasn't bad. Yeah. It's nice. I mm-hmm. didn't think either one of them were going to turn out. Delicious bread. It's always so exciting when you open it after that first 20 minutes. Uh-huh. It's like opening This is a the high I'm chasing now, folks. <laughs> it's a sad state of affairs. The bread making high. And I've decided that my challenge in quarantine will be the bread, and my challenge out of quarantine will be losing all the bread weight. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's all tied to the bread. <laughs> I feel really in touch with my peasant roots. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank our sponsor this week, StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps your loved ones share stories through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. It's the gift of spending time together wherever you live. Get started right away without the need for shipping by going to storyworth.com slash walk-ins. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash walk-ins for $10 off. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>